Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Crumbling the Super Cookie and Other Ways the FCC Protects Your Internet Traffic. We are in South Seas IJ with Travis LeBlanc and Jonathan Mayer. Before we begin, a few brief notes. Stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB. The Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on Level 3, and of course the Arsenal Reception at 5. If you haven't picked up your merchandise today, is your last chance to visit the Black Hat Swag and Bookstore. Visit the Cali Linux Lab in Mandalay Bay A. And thank you for putting your phone on vibrate. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore the ringing while you wait for your voicemail to pick up. And there you go. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Travis LeBlanc. I am the chief of enforcement at the Federal Communications Commission. I am joined today by Jonathan Mayer, uh, who is our chief technologist in the Enforcement Bureau. Um, thank you for coming to our talk. I know that uh, we are stopping you from uh, the receptions that are going to take place right after this, but we promise to have some really interesting and cool information to share with you about the work that we're doing at the Federal Communications uh, Commission. Uh, you'll have to forgive me for wearing my uh, friendly FCC hat up here. It's the closest I could find on government funds to a black hat. Um, but more importantly, it helps me with these lights, which I am able to, uh, to, to shield out so that I can see uh, all, of, uh, all of you. Um, I uh, am going to uh, chat with you a little bit today, uh, along with Jonathan, about uh, the FCC in general, um, the work that we're doing, and in particular some of the enforcement actions uh, that are here as we're going to talk to you about uh, crumbling uh, the super cookie and the other ways the FCC protects your security and privacy. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Jonathan. I'm on loan to the FCC from Stanford. Um, and, and part of my, my aim in, in presenting to you today is to persuade you that the FCC has gotten kind of cool. Um, and so you might have heard of, sort of the, the old FCC, the stuff that the agency used to be a little more focused on. Uh, so for instance, um, it uh, picked a, a, a bit of a fight with uh, Eminem. You may remember his lyric on point. Um, uh, or uh, there was a sort of memorable uh, exchange uh, with the uh, creators of the TV show Family Guy. Um, uh, they did a little song about the FCC. Um, uh, so, so the FCC used to have a uh, sort of focus on, the, on those types of controversies and again my, my hope is to persuade you that the, the new FCC is a lot cooler than that. Um, um, we're not too cool though, so for instance here's the actual entrance to FCC headquarters right now. There's like a Pokemon Go what did you catch board um, and uh, to add like extra dorkiness to it you can see uh, some folks caught an unlicensed broadcast station uh, are over on the side, the, the chairman of the agency and one of the commissioners. So we're not that cool. Um, but my hope is to persuade you that, uh, that, we, that we've gotten a lot cooler than we used to be. So at a high level, the FCC is the Federal Regulatory Agency for Communications, Infrastructure, and Services. Um, and that includes uh, being the regulatory agency for communications, security, and privacy. Um, the way the federal government is structured for addressing security and privacy is a little unusual. Uh, we have sector-specific regulators. Um, and so here are some examples of them on the left, by no means an exclusive list. Uh, we work on communication security and privacy. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services addresses medical security and privacy. Our colleagues at the FAA work on airplane security and privacy. Department of Education deals with educational record security, privacy, and so on. And then over to the right, the FTC has uh, really been a thought leader in the space. It has authority to address unfair and deceptive business practices, uh, which can uh, include security and privacy issues. It also has some authorities around children's security and privacy and financial security and privacy. So a little different, for those of you who, who, who might be from outside the United States, a little different from how some other countries have addressed these issue areas. We don't have a sort of unified data protection regulator. Uh, again, sector specific. So uh, there, there are three topics we'd like to move through today. Uh, the first one is an overview of the agency, um, the, the structure of the place, its, its authorities, uh, and how it acts. Uh, then we'd like to talk through some of our recent enforcement actions, uh, many of which have been in the news. Uh, and we'd like to close by looking at some of the work in progress, because we've got some pretty exciting stuff coming up um, uh, in, in, uh, in the hopper. Uh, so we're going to turn it back over to Travis to give an overview of the agency. Uh, 
thanks, Jonathan. Um, this is what I like to think of as sort of just FCC 101 for those who may not be intimately familiar with the Federal Communications Commission or uh, the structure of regulatory bodies in the United States. Uh, the FCC um, is an independent uh, agency. And what that generally means is that uh, the heads of the agency, while appointed by the President of the United States, uh, don't, can't ultimately be removed uh, by the President. Uh, as an independent agency, uh, the FCC's authority is established by Congress. Uh, our authorizing statute is called the Communications Act. It's located within Title 47 of the United States Code. Um, that is the source of all authority uh, for every action that the Commission takes. Uh, the leadership of the commission is uh, it's led by five individuals um, who are appointed by the president and confirmed by the United States Senate. Um, at least uh, three, no, no more than three of which can be from any one party, meaning it's inherently a bipartisan uh, leadership structure uh, that, uh, that we have. Uh, the decisions of the FCC, uh, whether they are uh, regulatory in nature or adjudicatory in nature, are ultimately reviewed by, uh, by the courts uh, in the United States and, and the, the Supreme Court. Um, as an independent agency, the FCC independently uh, proposes, enacts, and enforces its rules. Uh, generally, the way our process works is that whenever the commission decides to uh, tackle an issue, uh, and, and it can do that by having an outsider file a petition uh, to request a rulemaking, or it can do it by the commission of its own uh, volition deciding to pursue an issue, we put out a proposal. Uh, that proposal uh, for a rulemaking is publicly available, and the public has an opportunity to comment on it. Once we receive those comments, uh, we then, uh, the commission votes to issue a final order, which are the actual uh, regulations. Uh, we can begin, as they're implemented and going into effect, we can begin enforcement of those as well. But what's neat about the agency is it's one that not only proposes rules, uh, but it enacts the rules and it enforces them. In many ways, it has, uh, it shares a lot of the authority of all the branches of the U.S. government because it has a legislative, executive, and a adjudicative function. Um, you know, most of the federal government works for uh, this fine gentleman, the President of the United States, um, but we at the FCC actually work for that dapper group of commissioners. Um, there are five of them, as I mentioned before. Um, they are, uh, 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 as I mentioned, uh, appointed by the president and um, confirmed by uh, the, the Senate of the United States. Uh, they can only be removed for cause. And uh, I, it, what I'm going to do now is turn it back over to uh, Jonathan, who is going to talk to you a little bit about some of the technologies that we regulate. So within the Communications Act, there are certain classes of technology that the FCC regulates. Um, so here, here are uh, some of the biggies. They're not the only ones, but um, uh, ones that we deal with quite often. Uh, the FCC regulates radio uh, and everything else that uses uh, radio frequency spectrum. Um, uh, the FCC regulates telephones, uh, both uh, uh, wireless and if you happen to still have one wireline. Um, regulate television uh, over uh, broadcast, cable, fiber, satellite, and whatever comes next. Um, and uh, most recently, the commissions had quite a focus on internet service, uh, cable, DSL, or fiber to the home, uh, also uh, wireless service on your phone. Um, so I want to focus in just a little bit on the internet service, uh, because the, the structure of the commission's authority is a little unique, and the controversy around that authority has been quite high profile. So here's sort of the textbook network architecture for some consumer using their, their laptop and communicating with some online service. Of course, the, the internet's gotten far more complicated than this. This is sort of the trivialized example. So they have some access internet service provider, residential or wireless, that they use to handle their traffic. Uh, that ISP in turn hands off the traffic to a backbone ISP, turn hands off the traffic to some other backbone ISP. Uh, 
Traffic then goes on to a transit ISP providing service to a business, and finally the online service gets the traffic, and you, know, you have your reverse path back to the consumer. So the FCC has really been focused on the access internet service provider market uh, in the green box over there. Um, let me explain why the FCC has been so focused on that specific part of the internet infrastructure. Um, broadband ISPs uh, have, some, ha have some distinctive traits. Uh, they're gatekeepers to the internet for most Americans. Uh, so most Americans have some sort of uh, service that they subscribe to. Most Americans, uh, at least for wireline, uh, only have one option for high-speed service. So uh, competition is, is not where it could be. Uh, these companies have a unique ability to affect network performance. They can speed things up and slow it down. Um, and that, in turn, can impact innovation economics. Um, if they favor a specific company or disfavor a specific company, that can tilt the playing field for online services. Uh, ISPs also have a unique role in network security and privacy. They handle all of a customer's uh, internet traffic, have the ability to look at all of a customer's internet traffic. Um, and so uh, it's kind of a, a unique vantage point uh, instead of risks. Uh, and last but not least, uh, ISPs are increasingly converged providers for a range of communication services. Increasingly, the same company that provides you your, your internet at home also provides you phone service, also provides you TV service, and the list keeps growing. And that information can be commingled, can be at risk in similar ways. Um, and so, uh, for those reasons, we've, we've really zoomed in on the access ISPs. And the debate came to a head uh, fairly recently uh, over an issue called net neutrality, which I suspect uh, most of you have heard of. Uh, it played out quite a bit on TV, on the internet, kind of every other medium. And let me explain a little in detail what the net neutrality issue was about um, from the sort of Communications Act perspective. So there was a, a dispute over which part of the act the commission should use uh, for regulating access internet service providers. Um, and the two options uh, 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 it, in a rough sketch were Title I, which deals with information services, and Title II, which deals with telecommunications carriers. And roughly speaking, the Commission has much more authority for services that are within Title II. And so the, the debate was about whether uh, access internet service providers should be uh, moved into the Title II category when previously they'd been in the Title I category. Uh, ultimately, the Commission concluded they should be relocated into Title II. And effective mid-2015, uh, the Commission set out new rules uh, for uh, uh, access internet service providers, um, uh, commonly known as net neutrality rules. In Commission lingo, um, they're called open internet rules. Um, something I've learned as a computer scientist working in the government, uh, everything gets rebranded. So network neutrality is open internet. Uh, an access ISP is a broadband internet access service, or BIAS. There's just a whole different lingo about this whole thing. Um, so, here are the rules. Uh, first up, no blocking of lawful services. Right? You want to go to a website, use an app, uh, your ISP uh, can't, can't stop you from doing that. Uh, similarly, no throttling. Uh, if uh, throttling were uh, to the point, uh, you know, very, very slow connectivity, could be effectively blocking. Uh, and of course, can imbalance the uh, 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 innovation online in that um, uh, someone, let's say, who wanted to come up with a competitive video service might not be able to make that service work if their traffic were throttled. So uh, very important to put that rule in. So that's the no slow lanes rule. It's corollary with the no fast lanes rule, or no paid prioritization. Again, this recognition that internet economics could be really imbalanced if a company could buy its way uh, into uh, a better ability to communicate with customers. Uh, and then uh, there is a, uh, a general conduct standard, recognizing those three bright line rules might not catch everything that could significantly alter the playing field. Um, so in addition to no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, also no unreasonable interference or disadvantage. Um, so that's, what, that's, that's the notion behind that rule. Uh, and then an enhanced transparency rule, the idea being that uh, an ISP has to give customers uh, adequate information to make informed choices about service and also has to give them accurate information about their service. So those are the rules that came into effect in mid-2015. Uh, uh, more recently, early 2016, the Commission proposed rules specific to security and privacy, uh, addressing uh, conditions under which ISPs uh, maintain customer data and choices around that. We're going to touch on the security and privacy rules a little bit later. So that's sort of the rule landscape. Um, the Commission's rules on, on, on most major issues do, do get challenged in court, um, and the courts have an important role in reviewing the rules to make sure they're consistent with uh, the Communications Act, 
And so just about a month and a half ago, the DC uh, Circuit released a lengthy opinion reviewing the commission's, um, uh, reviewing the commission's uh, open internet rules. Um, and the panel concluded the commissions were consistent with the Communications Act, sustained the rules. Uh, and so net neutrality is uh, clearly the law of the land. Um, uh, in, in computer science terminology or something like it, we got the check. Okay. So there's an overview of uh, the FCC's authority and its process. Uh, now I'm going to hand the, hand the podium back over to Travis to talk about some of our enforcement actions. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about the uh, security and privacy and high profile security and privacy enforcement actions uh, that we've recently taken. Um, I think a number of them will be of particular uh, interest to this group. Uh, we've, on, we've also thrown in oh, one or two um, uh, that, uh, that aren't about security and privacy, but uh, we think that this group of folks will probably uh, be very interested in. So please excuse me for, uh, for cheating you for just a little while, but I, I think you will find them uh, entertaining, um, if not informative. <laughs> Uh, the first one that I want to talk to you about is the so-called Verizon super cookie. And many of you may be aware that a few years ago, Verizon began to deploy a targeted advertising program that allowed the company working through with some of its partners to effectually better uh, track the, uh, the, the, the browsing activities of its uh, subscribers. Uh, this was concerning to the FCC because we have a rule on the books that requires an ISP to provide its customers with sufficient information about its network practices so that they can make an informed choice about which provider they want to choose between. Uh, this technology, I think it's probably helpful to just to walk through uh, how Verizon intended uh, for this business model to work. Um, step one is a subscriber's browser or app sends HTTP requests. This is normal. I mean, all of our uh, phones do this anytime that we uh, browse uh, the web or, or use an app. That re those requests go through Verizon, uh, which would then insert a unique identifier as an additional HTTP request header, uh, effectively allowing uh, Verizon or anyone with access to the header to know uniquely who the origin of this traffic came from. Uh, that information is then, uh, as the, uh, the, the consumer or subscriber visits various websites, it's then passed on through to uh, a third party advertising exchange which receives the header information and then forwards it on to data brokers that may be participating in that exchange. Those data brokers who now are able to see the header uh, uh, information will then uh, use that to match it with data from Verizon. Uh, it may be demographic data, such as uh, it's a male uh, between the ages of 20 and 30. It may be geolocation information that Verizon just provides about the header. But now as a data broker, you have the ability to not only know basic general de demographic information, but also know particularly where this demographic is, uh, is, 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 is browsing uh, on the web. Um, that information is then used uh, to put together to target uh, advertisements uh, directly to uh, consumers. And of course, at the end of the day, everybody gets a little bit of, uh, a little bit of money. Verizon gets some compensation. The, uh, the data brokers, the exchanges uh, make a little money as well as the ads uh, are served. Um, we uh, uh, learned about this um, uh, through uh, both uh, complaints as well as a number of uh, news articles uh, that came out about the super cookies. And here was our concern uh, from the, in the Enforcement Bureau. Uh, Verizon began its UIDH program in around December of 2012, but it actually didn't tell anyone about it 
for nearly two years until October of 2014 uh, during, during, during the midst of our investigation. It's a little troubling to think that a company was uh, injecting uh, information that could be used for targeted advertising uh, uh, to all its millions of customers without telling any of them uh, about it um, for, for almost two years. Uh, when they did finally decide to disclose information about the program, Verizon claimed that the UIDHs were unlikely to be used other than as Verizon had intended as part of its advertising program. But what actually turned out is we found that in fact at least one of Verizon's own partners, a company called Turn, uh, was, was at least one that was public, at least one of those uh, partners used UIDHs to resurrect tracking cookies, um, effectively circumventing uh, browser and operating system privacy protection. That is, uh, consumers uh, have the ability in their, uh, in their browser, uh, for example, uh, to delete a cookie, right? And we thought that was a way to protect privacy. But what the UIDH does is it allows the network level to begin to reassociate. Even if you delete the cookie, if it comes back and you still have the header traffic, you can take the information you had on the prior cookie because it's the same header and connect the two together, effectively uh, mitigating the effect of deletions of cookies. Uh, we were also uh, troubled that Verizon not only inserted the UIDH into its own subscribers' traffic, but into the traffic of non-Verizon customers who may have been roaming on the Verizon network as well, so that they were able to see where they were, uh, w w where they were uh, browsing and, and potentially target ads to them as well. Um, we uh, ended up happily settling this case earlier this year. Uh, we fined Verizon uh, a modest uh, fine, I would say, of $1.35 million. But the important point about this was not the fine. What we, what we were able to garner as part of the settlement was that Verizon was going to be required to obtain opt-in uh, consent before injecting UIDHs into HTTP requests to third-party websites. This was in addition to actually informing um, its customers that it was actually using this program, but it was important that those consumers opt into the program, that they not be opted in by Verizon and not told about it, but that they have the ability uh, to make a choice before this information was uh, provided to third-party websites. We also uh, required Verizon to offer a choice to entirely withdraw uh, from the UIDH program if you wanted to have nothing, uh, nothing to do with it as a Verizon customer. And uh, we prohibited them from injecting uh, the UIDH uh, into MVNO traffic. Really a uh, good settlement, we think, for, uh, for all Verizon uh, consumers, as well as for mo promoting uh, you know, privacy principles of uh, transparency, uh, of choice um, as well. The next cases that I want to talk about are a couple of data breaches that we've, uh, we've uh, recently uh, pursued as enforcement matters. Um, Generally speaking, uh, a telecom carrier has a responsibility to protect uh, the confidentiality of uh, customer information. Um, we have similar provisions that apply to cable and satellite television uh, providers as well, which are uh, required to take all reasonable, to take all necessary steps uh, to uh, protect the security of customer information. Uh, in the last couple years, we've taken some pretty significant uh, enforcement actions in the wake of uh, some very serious uh, data breaches. Uh, the first one that I want to talk with you about today is, uh, involves uh, AT&T. Um, and here it's a fascinating uh, case. So AT&T, uh, like, uh, like many companies in the United States, operates call centers outside of the United States. Uh, in this case, AT&T operated a call center in Mexico. And the way you ended up at the AT&T call center in Mexico is you dial AT&T AT from your phone to reach customer service. Uh, it says press 1 for English, press 2 for Spanish. If you press 2 for Spanish, then you got routed to the call center, may have been routed to the call center in, in Mexico. Um, the, there were three call center representatives in Mexico who were being paid by a third party. Uh, in this case, his name was El Pelon. 
Uh, we believe that El Pelon is a Spanish moniker for, uh, for a bald-headed man. Um, El Pelon uh, would provide those three customer service reps with, uh, with, with telephone numbers. Um, and those customer service reps then went into AT&T's uh, AT systems and would obtain personal information about uh, AT&T customers. Uh, their names, uh, their partial social security numbers, which the customer service reps would then give back to El Pelon. Now why might El Pelon want this information? Well, it appears as if El Pelon was trafficking in stolen locked cell phones. And so El Pelon, who had these locked phones, wanted to get them out of where, whatever country he was in, Mexico, the United States, and ship them abroad where they could then be resold as unlocked phones. But to unlock the phone, you have to get a code from AT&T so that it can be unlocked. So El Pelon needed uh, personal information about AT&T's customers, which he then used to go back to AT&T's website and enter the information to obtain the unlock code. Uh, El Pelon um, uh, asked for information uh, in the course of about 168 days from these three customer service reps for 68,000 AT&T customers. 68,000 records. One can only wonder over that three month period how many calls did those customer service representatives take? You know, the chance that they were actually taking calls is quite slim. They were looking through records and getting paid by El Pelon. Well, um, uh, uh, El Pelon then actually used that information to access um, uh, 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 the, the, the to submit unlock requests for over uh, 280,000 um, AT&T customers. As we investigated this case and began to dig in further, we found that AT&T also operated a call center in Colombia. And it turned out that in Colombia, uh, the managers actually found out that there were customer service representatives who were being paid to provide third parties with personal information about AT&T's customers. The managers called in those customer service representatives, they promptly fired them, and then the managers got in on the gig so that they could get paid for the information. We continued to investigate and found out that in the Philippines, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, there were customer service representatives at another AT&T uh, call center who were also being paid uh, to provide uh, information to third parties on AT&T customers. Overall, there were at least 30 to 40, uh, 40 uh, customer service reps in these call centers in Colombia and uh, the Philippines that were in on this. There were approximately another other 300,000 uh, AT&T customers that were affected by the breaches in the Philippines and Colombia, given that none of the people were talking to each other, uh, so it appears, uh, in each of these call centers, we knew we had a massive compliance problem um, uh, in the company. Um, and uh, we ended up settling this case with AT&T for $25 million. Um, uh, importantly, uh, we required um, better monitoring of what's going on in the call centers, better training um, for the, the call center uh, representatives. One could only think that if, you know, if, if, if AT&T uh, limited the information that customer service representatives had access to, if they monitored where the, the vast number of records that they were going to, that they might have caught this uh, a little bit earlier. Another case uh, that, uh, that we did recently uh, involved Cox uh, Communications, which is a fairly large cable uh, phone and uh, internet service provider in the United States. Um, this was a case in which a member of the Lizard Squad hacking group, I don't know if we have any here in the audience today, uh, but uh, this one was Evil Jordy. Um, Evil Jordy uh, called up a customer service representative uh, at Cox and said, uh, hey, this is Joe from the IT department. I need you to go over to this website over here and enter your login information, your ID, your password. And of course, Evil Jordy was on the other side of the website. He suddenly had uh, their login and password. Uh, at this time, uh, Cox did not require multi-factor authentication, and therefore, Evil Jordy was able to have all of the same access that a customer service representative uh, had at this time, that was access to uh, the personal information of all of Cox's six million or so um, subscribers. 
uh, Evil Jordy then went into uh, uh, went into the Cox database and he uh, he targeted a number of customers. He locked them out of their accounts. Uh, he changed their security uh, question answers. Uh, and, and in fact, he even went to social media and found them on social media and harassed them. Tried to embarrass them with information uh, about their account. This was truly uh, a, a trouble and tra traumatic uh, to them. Um, and we ended up settling this case. It was uh, for six hundred thousand uh, dollars as a fine. But more importantly, we wanted to make sure that there was multi-factor authentication uh, in place. We wanted to make sure there was training that was put in place. And I tell you about these cases at a conference like Black Hat because the reality is that is the, the vast majority of data breaches that we see, they look like this. They look like pretexting. They look like employees who were on the take or who were uh, not being monitored. They're not all intrusions by outsiders who are finding a sophisticated way to get around the IT architecture. This is the reality. And so as we, as we look at the, 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 the vendors that are here, as we think about uh, how to improve uh, security and better protect privacy, um, we're really thinking hard not only about sophisticated attacks, those are important, cyber incidents are important, but we're also just thinking about the basic ones, the vast majority that really get down to physical threats, uh, that really get down to employee training. And we can't overemphasize that human error and human mistakes is a a large part of the, the potential threat uh, that's out there as well. Turn it back to Jonathan. Thanks. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work the Commission's done on Wi-Fi blocking. So this is a practice where um, uh, you try to set up a, an access point, like a hotspot on your cell phone, or try to connect to an access point. It just doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because someone's messing with your network connection. Um, and the law here is really very clear. It's a violation of federal law to willfully disrupt radio communications, period. So let me explain how the Wi-Fi blocking technology usually works. It can work in a variety of ways. This is the most common mechanism. So uh, here is the sequence of requests and responses in connecting to a Wi-Fi network. Um, uh, so this is this flow from probing the network, then authenticating to the network, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, then uh, associating with the network, and then finally application traffic can flow back and forth uh, between your device and the Wi-Fi network. So this handshake happens, and ultimately you've got your connection established. Um, those frames that go back and forth to probe, to authenticate, to associate with the network, and then ultimately to carry traffic, for the most part, don't have protection of, of any sort applied to them. Uh, there, there is part of the 802.11 standard that can be used to provide protection, but it's not widely deployed. And so the result is that uh, someone can uh, uh, send frames for managing your connection um, uh, that muck with your connection. Um, and in particular, uh, there's a well-known attack where you can send deauthentication frames. Deauthentication frames are just one of the many types of 802.11 frames um, to your device and cause it to get, uh, uh, get knocked off of a Wi-Fi network. If it tries to reconnect to that network, then send another deauthentication frame. And the net result is your, your connection to that network just isn't going to work. It's going to look like there's something wrong. So uh, a, f a fair amount of uh, enterprise-grade uh, network equipment has the ability to send deauthentication frames. All right, that can have some very, very legitimate uses if you want to kick someone off of your own network. It gets a little more troubling if you're trying to kick someone off of another network. You know, managing your own network is very different from managing someone else's network. There are a bunch of reasons why the FCC has been concerned about Wi-Fi blocking uh, out in the wild. One is it thwarts competition in the ISP marketplace. So uh, if you uh, have the ability to choose between a hotspot you pay for and the Wi-Fi that's installed in a certain, certain place, that's important competition. And if the, the hotspot is blocked, there's only one provider, there's less competition. Another important reason that uh, comes to mind in the context of Black Hat is you might be in a place where you don't trust the Wi-Fi. Um, and so you might want more secure wireless connectivity. You might trust your own hotspot running back over the cellular network more than the Wi-Fi uh, at the location. Uh, you can't use your hotspot if your hotspot's blocked. Another reason to be concerned about this is folks paid for it. So if you've paid for your, your, your hotspot, you, know, you have a plan that includes one, um, uh, you're, you're prevented from benefiting from what you pay for on a monthly basis uh, if that hotspot's blocked. 
And, and last, and again, certainly not least, um, it's just a total pain in the butt to figure out what's going on if there's Wi-Fi blocking, right? It seems like your hotspot's not working. It seems like you just kept getting dropped off of a network. And that's a waste of time. It might lead to finger pointing at the wrong people. Uh, so, so very, very difficult to identify and resolve what's going on. And don't just take the FCC's word for it that Wi-Fi blocking is, is a real pain. Um, I think this might be the only time where the New York Times editorial board has chimed in on a specific Wi-Fi network management practice. Um, they actually wrote an editorial about how uh, hotels were, were deploying these Wi-Fi blocking technology, and they called it brazen. Um, so uh, uh, so that, that was their conclusion. Um, we, for our part, uh, investigated and have, have brought a, a few cases in this area. I want to focus on uh, probably the most high profile one against Marriott in late 2014. Um, so Marriott was uh, blocking um, uh, uh, Wi-Fi access points, including hotspots, uh, at its hotels and their associated convention spaces. Um, and uh, uh, Marriott's business model here was it charged quite a bit of money for uh, folks who wanted to, uh, uh, at, to have a booth at a convention and allow folks to, to connect or wanted to uh, manage a convention and have Wi-Fi for each visitor, in some cases charging up to $1,000 per device per day for internet connectivity at one of these locations. Uh, so again, competition pretty important in this space. Um, so ultimately, the, the FCC settled with, uh, settled with Marriott uh, for $600,000 uh, in fines and a compliance plan to make sure Marriott properties uh, don't deploy this Wi-Fi blocking technology elsewhere. Um, uh, there have been other cases, again, uh, relating to, to companies that manage um, uh, 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 convention spaces, uh, providing IT services, uh, and also uh, other ho uh, hotel locations. So uh, the FCC has been very clear about the law in this area uh, and that you have a right to use your, your personal hotspot that you pay for. Let me touch on another area we have uh, recently did some work in. In fact, uh, just this week did some work in. Um, and that's related to interference from wireless devices. Um, so let me uh, start with the legal principle here. So violation of federal law to market a wireless transmitter that can be easily modified to create interference. But it's important to note the limits of the FCC's interest here. The FCC's only interest is interference. Otherwise, modify away. Uh, the FCC has said again and again, it's a big fan of innovation. The whole point of the net neutrality rules is to promote innovation. Um, and so uh, you know, if, if it's lawful uh, and someone wants to modify a device for uh, their own interest or to uh, try to build a business model or to do research or because they're a hobbyist, um, uh, again, and it's lawful, the FCC supports that freedom to tinker. So the, the, ag uh, the agency, again, big fan of innovation. So this week, we announced a settlement with TP-Link, uh, a major consumer Wi-Fi router vendor, um, related to a Wi-Fi router interference issue. Uh, the, the specifics of the issue were uh, TP-Link was selling routers. We could go in, change the country code, and broadcast on spectrum uh, that wasn't allocated for Wi-Fi in the US and could potentially cause interference. So we settled for a $200,000 fine and a compliance plan. Um, but the really unusual uh, part of this, this uh, settlement agreement, and the part that was really uh, particularly important to us and novel for the commission, uh, related to uh, compatibility with open source firmware. So uh, as a, a part of the consent decree, TP-Link is required to cooperate with the open source community and Wi-Fi chipset manufacturers uh, to work on enabling support for third party firmware on their routers. Um, in our view, it was a win-win-win. It's a win for the commission, because again, we're big fans of innovation and the freedom to tinker. It's a win for TP-Link, because they were gonna work on a, a feature on the routers that a lot, of, a lot of consumers and businesses and researchers were demanding. And uh, in turn, a win for those consumers, researchers, businesses, and so on, who would have access to another manufacturer of routers that'd be compatible with uh, firmware that they customized. So there's, there's an example of kind of a, a long-standing area of law around uh, radio interference where the commission um, is working hard to make sure its interest in innovation gets included in, in, into its enforcement work. Uh, now I'm going to hand it back to Travis to talk about uh, a decidedly not security and privacy issue uh, related to unlimited data. Well, before I go there, uh, let me just say one other thing about uh, Wi-Fi router interference. Since uh, I am the chief uh, law enforcement officer at the Federal Communications Commission, and this is uh, Black Hat. 
I just have to emphasize that our, uh, our uh, desire to have people tinker, it, it does mean it still has to be lawful. I just have to put that part out there, uh, that that's what we're supporting is lawful uh, tinkering. I don't want anyone to be confused uh, about other potential ways that uh, folks might, uh, might tinker. But we're going to talk about unlimited uh, data. Let me ask, I'm just wondering, ha, anyone in here have an unlimited plan today or had one in the past? Oh, that's a, a lot of people. That's almost half, ha, half the room. Um, you know, there are a number of uh, so-called unlimited data plans that are still available in the market today. Um, we have been uh, uh, concerned, at least in one instance uh, so far, um, and I'm going to talk to you about that, uh, that first enforcement action. Um, there's a uh, rule uh, at the FCC that an internet service provider must provide its customers with accurate information about its, uh, about its service plans. And um, in this case, uh, AT&T uh, offered, uh, has been offering or offered unlimited plans as early as 2007 surrounding the iPhone launch. And at that time, actually, AT&T had an exclusive uh, deal with, uh, with Apple that allowed it to be the only uh, carrier in the United States to serve, uh, to sell an iPhone. Uh, millions, I mean, it was very popular, millions of customers signed up for the AT&T Unlimited data plan. And uh, a few years later, as Verizon and uh, others began to gain access to, uh, to the iPhone and other smartphones uh, rolled out, and as people started to become more reliant upon, uh, high, uh, upon their, their data plans, um, AT&T instituted a policy of slowing down data after an unlimited plan subscriber, an unlimited plan, uh, used three to five gigabytes of data in a month. And so here was a situation where if you were a, a, an unlimited plan subscriber, you had paid for a so-called unlimited plan, and you used more than five gigabytes of data, AT&T would slow the rest of your data down uh, uh, to 256 or to 512 uh, kilobytes per second, regardless of whether there was any network congestion at all. Um, this was troubling to uh, lots of consumers, uh, thousands of them uh, complained to uh, regulators across the country, uh, state attorneys general received complaints, the Federal Trade Commission received complaints, the Federal Communications Commission uh, received complaints as well. Um, they were concerned uh, about the fact that they had, consumers generally were concerned that they purchased an unlimited plan and yet they didn't feel that they were getting high-speed uh, unlimited data. Uh, also, AT&T didn't provide uh, actual meaningful notice to subscribers when they were on a monthly basis approaching the cap or exceeding the cap. All of a sudden, you were just slowed down. Uh, it, in the course of our investigation, we learned that those customers whose data were slowed down to 256 to 512 kbps were slowed down on average 17 days per month. That means for those people that were slowed down over half the month on average, they were receiving this data that was so slow, the speed was so slow, you couldn't use the basic maps function on your smartphone. You couldn't use uh, a, 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 a video chat function like FaceTime. You couldn't use just basic, basic, basic activities that we expect and uh, that we should be able to use uh, when we're using our smart devices uh, these days. Uh, last year, uh, the commission charged AT&T with a $100 uh, million dollar fine. Uh, this is uh, a matter that is ongoing uh, right now, but it was the beginning of a process of beginning to look at, uh, at least in this case, the apparent lawfulness of unlimited plans where there are actually limitations placed upon, uh, uh, upon the, 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 the the data usage, and uh, moreover, uh, the extent to which disclosures need to be made uh, to consumers to ensure that they have sufficient and accurate information about their plan so that they can make a meaningful choice between uh, wireless providers. Um, these are the uh, recent enforcement actions uh, that we've just chatted about today. Uh, the last uh, category that we wanted to talk about are some of the works uh, in progress uh, that we have ongoing, and I'm going to pass this one back on to Jonathan. So there are uh, 
three areas that we've been working on that we want to highlight for you today. Uh, the first one, some new uh, security expectations that the Commission has set for uh, 5G wireless technologies. Uh, the second, uh, dealing with robocalls. Uh, so you may get these from time to time on your phone. You know, sometimes uh, uh, no one ever talks on the other end. Sometimes it's someone claims to be from the IRS, someone from card member services. It's a real problem. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, the third, uh, uh, the security and privacy rules I touched on earlier, uh, where the commission uh, was looking more closely at uh, precise rules on those issues for internet service providers. Uh, Travis is going to touch on uh, what the commission's proposed. So I'll start with 5G wireless. And by way of technical background, uh, 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 5G wireless technologies will likely in part um, uh, operate on certain upper microwave spectrum. Uh, that the Commission has uh, just recently been setting up the licensing scheme for. So again, the, the Commission deals with radio and other RF issues. One of its important roles there is setting up uh, licensing schemes for spectrum uh, and conditions on operating on certain spectrum. Uh, and so this, this microwave uh, uh, spectrum that previously wasn't particularly useful um, for communications owing to recent advances now really is useful for communications. Um, and so again, expectation 5G is going to use that in part. So uh, part of the Commission's 5G uh, proceeding related to security. And uh, the Commission sought comment on uh, what, it, uh, what it should uh, impose upon 5G service providers. Uh, ultimately, the Commission set up a uh, certification scheme. Uh, so beginning with getting information from, from companies that were going to be operating in the spectrum, providing these 5G services. Um, and then the, the, the Commission said it's going to, uh, 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 in the near term, kind of move forward on 5G security um, and uh, issue its, uh, a notice of inquiry, which is kind of a pre-rulemaking document trying to gather information from stakeholders on the issue. So, uh, so uh, there's a certification process that got set up to get information. Uh, and in, in the course of the certifications, uh, uh, upper microwave operators are going to have to provide to the Commission some information about their security. And, uh, and as part of providing that information, the Commission's articulated some expectations around that security. So the, here's, here's what the Commission said. Um, that there's an expectation for these 5G providers uh, that there's going to be protection for confidentiality, integrity, and availability of communications uh, between a mobile device and the back-end network, uh, between nodes on the back-end network that provide the wireless service, um, between one back-end network and another network, so routing security, uh, and then for telephone, voice, and text message services uh, between mo one mobile device uh, and another mobile device. So it's an end-to-end -end security for those specific services. So th those are the Commission's security expectations for 5G wireless. Uh, now let me touch on robocalls. Uh, the top complaint, far and away, that the FCC receives. Um, just last month, Chairman Wheeler sent letters to the CEOs of the major telecom firms urging immediate action on robocalls. Um, he made it very clear that he believes the industry uh, uh, holds uh, a responsibility in addressing this problem. And he, he urged them to take action, and he uh, asked for a, a, uh, a, a, re a reply detailing exactly what they were doing. And AT&T, in response, uh, has agreed to lead a multi-industry strike force. Uh, it's going to be uh, telecommunications firms and handset manufacturers and operating system vendors all working together to deliver immediate technical protections for consumers. Um, this problem's gone on long enough. Uh, and there are a few specific directions that AT&T's, uh, that the group led by AT&T is focusing on. Um, uh, if you'd like to learn more, AT&T has a blog post about it. Uh, they're focusing on uh, call authentication standards, uh, so making sure uh, that uh, uh, Calls, uh, particularly VoIP calls originating overseas, aren't going to get spoofed. Uh, they're focusing on uh, how to build a do not originate list for certain sensitive numbers. So for instance, someone shouldn't be able to pretend to be from the IRS phone number. Um, they're also working on standardizing compatible interfaces for sharing indicators and filtering uh, uh, robocalls. So uh, the, the sort of um, notion there being that in the same way you've got a spam button for your email account, uh, there should be a way in which you can uh, share information, like a spam button, for your cell phone. So that's uh, what the Commission's been up to of late, work in progress on robocalls. And uh, now back to Travis to talk about the security and privacy rules. 
All right. Um, in the interest of time uh, and, and wanting to leave some time for questions, I'm going to go very quickly on uh, the security and privacy rules for ISPs. As we mentioned earlier, uh, this year in March, the Commission uh, released a proposed set of rules uh, that would apply uh, privacy and security protections to Internet service providers. Um, we've long had similar rules provided to uh, common carriers uh, providing telecom telephone, basic telephone service, uh, but they've, the rules really the proposed rules center around three basic principles the first is transparency and that's the idea that consumers should know what information their ISP is collecting about them um, how that information is being used and with whom it's being shared uh, it should also uh, have sufficient accurate information about the privacy and security practices of the provider uh, the second basic principle is choice. And this is the idea that consumers should have a meaningful and formed uh, tools available to make choices about what information uh, is collected uh, and how it's used. And then the final information, uh, the final uh, category is security. And that's the idea that ISPs have a duty to protect the security and privacy of their, of their uh, subscribers. Um, this rule is current, the proposed rule is currently under consideration by the commission. The uh, comments periods have now closed, uh, and um, we, you know, we are excited to, uh, to to hopefully bring this one to conclusion um, in the near future. Um, with that being said, uh, we've reached the end of our presentation. If there are any uh, questions, and uh, right now we'd be happy to take those from folks. Probably have time for two. Um, yes, I'm interested in the FCC's position on law enforcement indiscriminate use of stingrays and how privacy um, plays and the FCC's position on that. So uh, the question is about whether the FCC has taken a position on the use of stingrays uh, by law enforcement. Yes. Um, the answer is the FCC has not taken a position uh, on, that, uh, on that issue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be a decision for the commission to make, but they have, as of now, they, uh, they have not, and anything that's pending or is, we don't comment on. Or maybe pending, yeah. So the slide you just put up for security said uh, ISPs must usually obtain opt in. Yeah, so uh, I can discuss usually, that. Usually. So. Yeah, so the question is, what does this slide in the privacy proposal, the line, mean about I ISPs must usually obtain opt-in consent to repurpose data? So the way the proposed rule works is that if your ISP wa wants to use information that you provide to it, personal information, to provide you the service, then it can do that with, it's deemed to have your consent to do that. That is, for you, you know, think of a basic phone call, it's the easiest way to do it. Um, for you to call from one number to the other, you have to share certain information with your telephone company. They have to know your phone number, they have to know the phone number you're calling. It's the only way they can provide the service to you. Um, that information is, you're just deemed to consent so that you can actually just can't gain access. Um, if your ISP wants to use that information to market other communication services to you, so from the company, so if I'm uh, a Comcast uh, or AT&T or Verizon, choose your company, and I want to um, offer you my own Comcast or AT&T or Verizon communication service, then I have to provide you the option to opt out of it. If I want to use it for any other purpose at all, if I want to share it with anyone, uh, the way the proposal is written is it has to be opt-in. So depending upon the use, uh, there's a different structure that applies, and that's why the word usually is written in there. Does the FCC, um, sorry. Does the FCC have an um, opinion about uh, building structures that can prevent access to wireless networks? So for example, in this uh, Marriott case, uh, they were actively jamming. But let's say they built a, their conference center in six-foot wall cement or, you know, coated the walls with metallic paint. Um, would, would that be considered willfully interfering? Uh, you know, that is an interesting question. I imagine, so the question is whether um, physical uh, actions that any individual or company might take to block 
uh, 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 a uh, cellular signal, uh, for example, is a violation of an FCC rule or law. Uh, I imagine this may be motivated by the recent bar, I think, in the United Kingdom that essentially built a Faraday box around the bar so that people couldn't talk on the phone. It was in England, so I didn't actually have to consider the question because there's one thing I know, which is that our jurisdiction does not go across uh, outside of the United States. But uh, the, the short answer is this is... Uh, 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 something that's new and innovative. We haven't thought about it yet, and so there's nothing uh, publicly where we've taken a position on whether there is a, a law. Generally speaking, I will note that the laws usually, you know, require uh, willful or malicious interference. Um, well, I mean, you, you could have plausible deniability. Oh, we need earthquake protection, or oh, you know, it, we just really like shiny walls in Vegas. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And look, look, you know, another example that could fall similar to that is there are many, uh, there are some companies and restaurants, public places, not public places, but uh, that will tell you you can't bring your phone in. Right? They'll just tell you, leave your phone outside, you can't bring it in at all. That's kind of a, a similar, uh, a similar uh, instance, and uh, we haven't taken a position, although uh, I have to admit that it's probably doubtful. Thanks. No problem. And unfortunately, uh, we can't. We have no more time for questions. But Jonathan and I will be uh, right outside the door and happy to uh, chat further with anyone. Thank you very much for staying with us.